Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special Monday night episode of Means of Creation. So why are we doing this special episode? Well, we're joined by our guest, James Young, who is the co-founder of Collabland, which is a tokenized community management system. He previously spent time working in social gaming at Zynga and Serious Business. But aside from that, he's also an esteemed patron of the arts because James purchased my very first NFT this weekend for 13.37 ETH. Thank you. Which I think makes him my one true fan. <laughs> and I just have to thank James because because of him, my NFT career is off to an absolutely smashing debut. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful for that. And besides this, he's also a graduate of the very first creator economy course cohort that I recently ran. I see some other students in here. Congrats, grads. So today we'll be talking about that NFT sale, social tokens, DAOs, online communities, and more. Lots to unpack. So James, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. This is great. Been listening to Means of Creation and learn a ton from the class. Highly, highly recommend Oh, it, I guess I am a true fan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you're at the very, very top of the fan pyramid that I had shown. Just in case anyone missed, because I do think that was hilarious. There's like the thousand true fans idea, which is, you know, people that may subscribe to you like uh, for $100 a year or something like that. And then yeah. Lee had the, the hundred true fans idea, which is like maybe people pay a thousand bucks for a course or something like that, or even more. And then the one true fan is is someone that'll buy an <laughs> nft for a lot of money so, yes and get into a bidding war and win absolutely <laughs> yeah so before we get into tokenized communities and the creator middle class and all that let's start with this nft sale so for background what happened was i finished teaching my last course my last class on thursday late at night i signed up for foundation then the next morning i wake up i decide to list this nft and so it goes live in the middle of the day on Friday, taking everyone by surprise. I didn't tell anyone that this was coming. Well, I told the, the course people in the Slack, but I didn't really make it public that this was coming. And it's, it's like a Taylor of, Swift album. You just want to. Yeah, it's people. like a surprise <laughs> drop in the middle of the pandemic. And so it's this animated piece of art called the creator middle class, which was a piece that's tied to my blog post from December called building the middle class of the creator economy. And then after an intense 24 hour bidding war, James ended up winning the auction for 13.37 ETH, which by any standards is a pretty sizable amount to spend. So thank you. And so James, I'd love to hear this story from your perspective, like walk me through what was going on in your mind when you were bidding for it and why you bought the piece, especially since you appeared with about 20 minutes to go left in the 24 hour auction. Yeah. So when you wrote about the, the creator middle class, I, I was like just screaming into my laptop saying like crypto can help. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, how do I make a connection and, and get this attention that I think crypto can have? And this is prior to like the whole, you know, NFTs blowing up. And so, you know, I was trying to engage and add value in, in the means of creation discord which I think I would highly recommend everyone to join that as well. And I was trying to engage and, you know, sign up for the class and it really spoke to me. And, you know, I had read this piece about investing as entertainment. And then I was just, just kind of thinking about, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation. And, you know, I guess it's this evolution in my mind from, if you think of these entrepreneurs as celebrities, you know, you think of like Steve Jobs and you would have the turtleneck and the jeans and there was a brand behind that. And then, you know, you have Elon Musk now, you know, I guess he just dropped the NFT today too, but you know, mm -hmm. he, he has a following like a personal brand and, you know, I'm coming at this and I'm like, you know, I think that crypto could help. There's a collision between web two and web three with the creator economy, I don't know how this will manifest itself. And, you know, taking your class and talking about what makes a creator and, you know, quote unquote cult leaders. And it just made me think like in web three, these socioeconomic networks, when I think about it in this backdrop of investment as entertainment, crypto is, you know, for lack of a better term, performance art. And I was like, okay, how would I get the attention? How do I move this conversation forward? 
Mm. And, you know, in college, I was reading Marshall McLuhan, The Medium is a Message. And I was like, you know what? What if I just communicated via this transaction? And what if I communicated and got attention by putting my own skin in the game here? And I think that has led to, to this conversation that's led to the opening of other people watching. I think in terms of when you look at just the saturation and noise in media, what is it that's novel? I, I think, so Michael White, he helped co-organize Occupy Wall Street was saying all these things about the activist movement. And like he was saying, you have to get people's attention first. And I was like, okay, maybe this is a way, this was an experiment of just putting a bet out there and getting attention. So all these kind of ideas, not well-formed, loosely associated with each other that made me come to this conclusion of just, I don't know, just YOLO, just let, let me just try this and, and, and do this. And then I was like, oh, you know, I, I, I know the person that had the highest bid and I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get into this like bidding war. And so I had a price in mind, but I was like, I'm going to have to win. And so I just ready. And, you know, I think 13.37 was the, the magic number. <laughs> right. That's Pretty incredible. Loose. Yeah, that's such an incredible story, especially the motivation being to send a message out there into the universe that crypto mm -hmm. could be the solution to a lot of the issues that I had spoken about in the original blog post. And so does that mean that this was your first NFT purchase? It was by far my most expensive one. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so it was, that's where the YOLO part comes in. You know, I, I bought NFTs in the past, but, you know, I've been part of the Ethereum ecosystem. You know, I was enamored by the DAO, which happened in 2016. Mm -hmm. And that set me down like a rabbit hole. And really my thesis from 2016 to now has been crypto is going to help reduce coordination costs. And, you know, when you think of a scarce digital asset, you know, I think, yeah, money makes sense. That's a killer app. Voting makes sense. That, that's another way of, you know, being able to express this scarce digital assets. And NFTs are another, like they're, they're collectible. And so I've had this thesis and I've been just seeing uh, what's been happening mainly from, you know, following you in terms of the creator economy and just kind of lopsidedness. And I was just like, you know, can... Can crypto help? I don't know how. And through NFTs, through just, you know, I have a background, help launch this decentralized autonomous organization, DAO, called Moloch, back in 2019. And, you know, was just experimenting just on myself because I was like, I got to live this. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that just being part of the experiment is now, I guess, kind of natural uh, for me now in crypto. Uh, and that's kind of what led me to this kind of higher end purchase, at least for me. Uh, yeah, totally. NFTs. I'm excited to jam on how crypto and NFT specifically can help build the creator middle class. I feel like it'd be useful maybe to go over like, what is the idea Lee, of the creator middle class for anyone who maybe hasn't, hasn't heard your thoughts on it yet? Yeah. For just a refresh of that idea. Essentially the phenomenon right now on most of these, at least like web two platforms, these social platforms, anything that has UGC content on it basically is that very, very few creators are making a living on them or monetizing to any degree that is meaningful. And so I published this piece in December, both on my blog, as well as in HBR, talking about different strategies that platforms could actually implement to help foster a broader swath of their creators being able to achieve financial stability and actually make a meaningful income from the platform. Basically, there's like a, a disconnect between how much time and energy and effort creators are pouring into these platforms versus what they're actually getting back in terms of compensation. And so this holds true whether you're looking at Spotify or Instagram or YouTube, or like whatever social platform, there's basically a very, very small slice of the creators at the top who are making probably millions of dollars and accruing much of the success and the viewership and the audience. 
and then a huge like torso and tail of creators who make nearly nothing. And so some of the ideas that I put forth were this concept of universal creative income, like maybe the platforms could actually subsidize or take like some of their own revenue and pay a guaranteed income to a broader base of the emerging creators on the platform. It could take the form of some sort of like algorithmic randomness where viewers would be able to discover emerging creators more easily rather than just being directed to watch the content that everyone else was watching. There were lots of other strategies in there that I had put forth like education for creators so that they could be more successful, different monetization methods that could enable them to be able to segment their fans and offer them various different products that would actually help them to price discriminate and to you know, charge a higher price if the fan had more affinity to them rather than just monetizing in this one size fits all way of like the advertising revenue share, which is prevalent and which obviously incentivizes for creators that have broader reach and scale. So that that was the idea in the, the piece around how we could help build the creator middle class and make success more prevalent among all creators. And so, yeah, I, I guess going back to NFTs and how this fits in. I have some ideas, but I would love to hear, James, your thoughts on how crypto and NFTs helps to build the creator middle class. Yeah, I think that right now we're still in this experimental phase. And I think that we need to have these like fun experiments. So the idea right now, because of the spotlight on mainstream with NFTs, purchase the NFT and I have this smart contract that once you lock your NFT in the smart contract, will then mint what they call an ERC-20 token, which is a fungible token. So Mm -hmm. effectively the mental model is you are cutting up this NFT into pieces. It's almost like a real estate timeshare, but in a crypto token form. And so you have these tokens and you can put them on what they call an automated market maker. And for those that don't know, you can go to like Uniswap and there's a bunch of these decentralized exchanges that you provide what they call liquidity. And so that when someone wants to buy these tokens, those tokens will always be available for purchase. And the price, depending on how many tokens are left in the bonding curve, will increase in price. And so it's not that the amount of the supply is the gating factor, it's the price of the token. So if there's like one token left, it'll probably be this astronomical price. And so why we do that? Well, people will want to purchase the token from the bonding curve because it's that token that is required to enter into this decentralized autonomous organization. It's basically uh, a group wallet, or you can think about it as like a community bank. So we have the NFT, step one, we put it into a contract, step two, we get these tokens out from it, step three, people purchase the token, step four, and once they purchase those tokens, what they're purchasing it with goes into the DAO, into the community bank, and then they get a voting share proportional to the amount of tokens that they put in as tribute. So what you have is you have a community bank and uh, users have shares and they can now vote on proposals. And these proposals that can be voted on are going to be for funding creators. Now the assumption for these creators is that they already have their own social token. And they'll put into this DAO as collateral some portion of their social token that, you know, it might be a little, might be a lot in exchange for that social, that creator token, they'll get some, some money that came from the sale of the sharded NFT. And now what you have is this like agreement right now because of tokens the creator and those that are in the DAO are bonded together in a way it's it's almost like Mm -hmm. a loosely coupled partnership and so it's the incentive or the game theory is that those that are in the DAO are going to want to help the creator because they're incentivized because the creator tokens 
are what is collateralizing the Dow. If the Dow makes good bets, the creator token price eventually should go up. So there's more value that gets accrued to not only the creator, but to the Dow, which creates a flywheel potentially. So that mm -hmm. now, you know, you want to foster more creators. And so this DAO becomes this like accelerator slash curation platform in a sense, kind of like a YC for crypto version of creators. And, you know, if you can get that flywheel spinning, creates a potential use case for uh, UCI. Right. Okay. So that's, that's really interesting. So essentially it's like, a fund that is going to be investing in emerging creators. And the way that they would invest in these emerging creators is by investing in their social tokens. But rather than being a centralized fund, it's a DAO that will have lots of different members, each with the ability to vote in the decisions. Is that basically mm -hmm. a summary? Yes, that, that's right. And the game theory for those that are in the DAO, so if you um, Google like Malik DAO, there's this mechanism we call rage quitting. So you have a proposal and instead of your funds being locked in the DAO, if you don't agree with where a vote is going, as long as you don't vote yes, you can rage quit. Meaning whatever proportion of funds that are left in this community bank, you can burn your shares and get a proportional return of what you've put into it. And Got so it. there's game theory here where, you know, you want to cooperate uh, and you want to get some type of consensus. So this is how it's like decentralized. Right. It sounds like, like having fund secondaries where any of your LPs could just exit the fund at any time, but in a totally decentralized crypto native way. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. I love the idea of like, groups of people who believe in, you know, a similar vision for a certain type of community, a certain type of creator, having this in innovative, like, governance mechanism, right, and, like, and funding mechanism. But I'm curious, there's, like, a link at the very beginning to an NFT, where you almost base the, the token that this group operates on, on an NFT, like, a specific NFT mm -hmm. of, like, an artwork or something like that. Like, tell me more about why it needs to be pegged to an NFT versus just starting it, like, from scratch. Right. So, you know, what's interesting about this, we could, you know, have started this DAO and, you know, typically you'll launch a token and you don't need an NFT per se, but, you know, in my eyes, I don't think that of the NFT as like a finished piece of work. I think of it as a call to arms, like a manifesto. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the thesis behind this community. And so the NFT embodies that. And those that are drawn to the NFT go, whoa, okay, there's a there's this social token behind, what is this? And then they get into it instead of like trying to understand what is this community about? This is kind of like the constitution or Game of Thrones, it's like the banner flag or whatnot for, for the house, if you will. Yeah, it's really Makes interesting. Sense. I mean, this particular piece of art does symbolize something that is very big and I think was designed as a call to action. So it makes sense that you would potentially use this as the central piece of this community. And going back to something that you had said earlier in this conversation, which was that you purchased the NFT as basically this way to send a message and to like, as a, I think you said in discord, it was a form of activism. I thought that was really interesting. And mm -hmm. I also do have to say that me minting the NFT and listing the NFT and putting it up for sale, I would agree that it was also a form of activism on my part. Like I didn't do it for the money. I was actually ready to like Venmo a friend to meet the reserve price so that I could save face and say that my NFT sold, but ultimately it mm -hmm. did have a great outcome. But the message that I wanted to send out into the world is that I, I believe creators should have more opportunities to monetize and that they should be able to like be appreciated and that appreciation can take a financial form. It's not that their work should just be consumed for free. It has financial value and economic value and deserves to be purchased and to have a value assigned to it. So my part 
of, of activism was putting this up for sale in the first place and running this experiment to try and send that message out into the world. And like, obviously if it had failed, that would have been a pretty tragic story. But yeah, I really like that idea of investing as a form of activism. Yeah, message received. And I think <laughs> that it's so much more powerful, right? Than a like. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's why it's activism, right? I think you're seeing this more broadly with things that are happening on Reddit, Wall Street bets. And this is why for me, you know, when Wall Street bets happened, you know, I wanted to reach out to Michael White in terms of Occupy Wall Street. What happened there that Occupy maybe didn't totally fulfill it? Because he had said that, you know, after Occupy and everything died down, he publicly stated that like he had to go on food stamps. And so he was saying that, you know, with Occupy, it's kind of, you know, you just got to try and fail. And, you know, in when he was talking, I was just like, oh, Occupy was activism product fit. It was much like a startup, but he wasn't using the same terminology. And then BLM and these other movements were able to refine. And that made me think, wow, you know, was Occupy the, you know, the friendster of activism online or what he calls clicktivism. And, you know, I had, don't have all my thoughts fully fleshed out there, but, you know, this is like, I guess, impact investing, but it's like a conversation that we're having yeah. this dialogue is performative. Yeah. And we're going to see where this goes. It's like, you know, kind of an extension of building in public. It's just activism in public and gaining momentum because, you know, it's so noisy online. So how do you rise above the noise and how, you know, you come for like, oh, this is fascinating. You know, you're at that kind of superficial level where you initially get attention and then you follow it up with something you know, that that's substantiated behind it. And so this is why I think it's not just the NFT sale. The NFT sale is the beginning of a, of a conversation, of a dialogue yeah. that led to this conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. and it will be ongoing. Absolutely. I feel like there were also messages being sent in the prices. Like the prices that people bid were performative themselves and the prices are all public. So yeah, tell us about the the bid that you won with 13.37 and like what meaning that has and was that your absolute price ceiling or was that, you know, the target that you were hoping to land on? You know, 13.37, it's kind of ironic, you know, a creator middle class, but buying it with a price that's elite. And I was like, oh man, if I don't do it at 13.37, am I going to have to fork over 420 ETH for this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I was just like, please. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, the next step up is pretty big. Yeah, or 69, you know, there's these like magic numbers on the internet, right? And so, you know, I was lucky that it was, it was that, yeah. that price. That's amazing. One piece as you were describing this idea of the DAO for investing into creators, you had mentioned that like one of the sort of prerequisites to make this work is that creators would have to have their own social tokens. And so mm -hmm. I want to talk about like what needs to happen for that to work and specifically, well, maybe first I would love for you to unpack the idea of a social token for everyone here mm -hmm. and then I'll dive in more. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you know, kind of growing up, if you will, in the Ethereum ecosystem, especially from a developer perspective, it's always been about the technology and you have these projects, you know, I'm sure everyone has heard of DeFi where the, the rules of the game that's to be played to get yield, you know, and to farm is embedded in the protocol. So that means that the logic is already prescribed in, in a smart contract. Whereas like social tokens, like, you know, the, the one that comes to mind is like Alex Mazmesh and these other community mm -hmm. tokens, there isn't this like prescription of like, you know, the, the token does X, Y, and Z. It's not, there, there isn't a, a smart contract behind it saying that you deposit, you get yield, other people borrow, all that kind of stuff. 
And so social tokens, you know, when you talk to a specific subset of like people in the Ethereum ecosystem are like, what, what is going on here? Like, wh where, where is this value being derived from? And it's more on that, that like human level. Uh, do you believe in that person? Do you, are you going to back this community? And so, you know, that's kind of how I distinguish DeFi protocols that, you know, have everything prescribed in a contract versus DAOs that have governance logic baked into the contract and like social tokens or community tokens or social crypto. I don't know what the official term for it is that actually have it, you know, you're, you're just buying into uh, a community and you're, you're, you know, being part of something that's like just greater than you. And, and, and it's almost like a form of online government. You know, you're deciding the monetary policy, you're deciding the culture and you're deciding the norms. You know, I think Balaji Srinivasan talks about cloud cities uh, right. and crypto being cloud cities where you have these governments in the sky. And that is, you know, more akin to like social tokens because, you know, it's just, you know, value transfer within this closed economy. Yeah. I was having a conversation earlier today with a prominent TikTok creator. And we were talking about like what the path forward is for monetization for mainstream creators. So not crypto native creators, but just like creators that we see on social media. And, you know, today the accepted paths are like start a Patreon, start doing brand deals, maybe do an OnlyFans that's becoming more acceptable. And then we talked about social tokens and that still feels quite far out there. Like it hasn't really gotten mainstream adoption is my sense. And so I'm curious what you think needs to happen for it to reach that tipping point. And also like if you were talking to a mainstream creator and recommending a way for them to monetize, would you recommend social tokens or who would the ideal profile of a creator be for social tokens to be the, the right solution? Yeah, that's a great question. I think this is what we're going to figure out together. Okay. I think that we'll have these conversations, we'll have these experiments, we'll see what works, we'll see what doesn't work. And so I think that, so I'll, I'll give a story. So there was this token called Meme. It launched, I, I think it was like August of this last year, and they did what they call an airdrop. And mm -hmm. they, they, they airdropped these tokens and they came up with this uh, interesting, what they call NFT farming. And this is where I kind of got the pattern from talking about, you know, this sharding of the NFT and whatnot. What they did was you stake this meme token and you get pineapple points. And from there you can purchase NFTs and you can flip them. If you were part of the original airdrop in August and not, it's not just about price action, but it, it has impact, you know, in terms of, you know, what it could mean if, you know, this type of model could be put onto creators. You know, if you were part of that original meme airdrop, it's worth now about a million dollars. And what really blew my mind was that like when people was on CNBC, the, the meme coin was, was on the Chiron. And I was like, wow, that's how quickly things can get impacted. And so price, it's not about all about price action, but you know, it, it gets people's attention. And this is why, you know, again, part of the thinking in terms of buying the piece was to grab that attention and, you know, spending what I did on it. And so now we can have a conversation about this and figure this out together. When it comes to social tokens, I think what I see is, you know, you have a creator and they will launch your social tokens and that there's this whole part about liquidity that I kind of brushed over with Uniswap. And I think that the true fans, you know, the ones that buy all the merch that, you know, you know, do all the things, they, they will probably become liquidity providers. And then everyone else will just hold the token. So you have like the super fans, liquidity LPs, and then you'll have like just the regular fans that, you know, they'll, they'll buy and hold the token. And then these creators will provide other kind of incentives, whether it's like, if it's on discord, you know, maybe an AMA once a month or, you know, all of that. And I, I don't know, you know, kind of what norms will exist. I want to be sensitive to when it comes to tokens and especially after taking the, your course, when it comes to creator mental health 
want to have those conversations up front as well. And so this is why I, you know, kind of imagine, I don't, I hope it becomes kind of like, you know, what we do with the DAO and these tokens, more like a, a UCI that allows just like an alternative revenue stream. And, you know, we can, we, we can, we can iterate to, to what, what is, what is sustainable, what is meaningful. I think like also just like what is simple to adopt. I think that's a mm -hmm. big part of the reason why. NFTs were working so well and to what extent they'll continue to work well is like interesting because obviously it feels like we're, we're, we're nearing a sort of like short-term peak and then long-term who knows what else will happen but like mm -hmm. it's just conceptually mm -hmm. simple it's like yeah here's right. a here's a piece of art you and it has a precedent it, buy it, in the real world option. yeah exactly it's like conceptually very simple whereas stuff like a DAO and these other things which are yeah. cool once you dig in but conceptually not simple, you know, yeah. and don't have, have, don't have as many antecedents in like the sort of like analog world or the fiat world or whatever you want to call it. Like, mm -hmm. I think, I think there needs to be like a, a simple, like what's the next step? Like, okay. NFT is maybe one of the simplest things or like Bitcoin or, you know, whatever those, these are like obvious, like analogs, like it's like gold or it's like owning mm -hmm. a piece of art, but like, what's the next thing that it's like X where X is something really simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this is, what we need to come up with or, or try to source and, and try to figure out. And this is going to take this playful experimentation, you know, and we're kind of at this, like, it's barely a toy phase here. And I, I, I wish I had the answer, uh, but I don't, but I, I want to be part of the conversation or at least participate how I can to make it happen. Yeah. Well, you're definitely going to be a part of the conversation with this UCI DAO. I think that'll be mm -hmm. really interesting and yeah, would love to support it however I can. And, you know, we need just a, a bunch more of these experiments. I do think that it needs to start off a little like lighthearted so people can feel like they're entertained and then get more serious. I think that's how we'll slowly iterate to getting more of these like features like a DAO, you know, like with Facebook, it started off with like a poke and you're like, what's mm -hmm. a poke, right? And then it evolved future wise. And so I think that it's going to be similar to it, you know, to answer Nathan's kind of, that kind of approach. I agree with it. Like NFTs are, you know, it, it's visceral. It, it's more tangible than like creating your own currency and like what is money and all these like abstract kind of esoteric questions and so we just need to figure out kind of the step by step how to how to get people slowly going down that that rabbit hole and if they decide not to go deep then they're fine with just the nft and like maybe holding some tokens and that just gives them permission into a chat group, you know, and they, they feel like they're helping almost like a charity or a cause. And that's great. And there'll be different rings of involvement, just like online communities. I think of it as like concentric circles. You can kind of stop, but what you want to do is create a mastery path that's fun to get to that core where you're actually being an LP and you're like, you know, vo actively voting in DAOs and whatnot, but you, you don't want to make it uh, too overwhelming. I think that's what, you know, when, when you're in crypto and you're in it long enough, you go through this like hurdles and this like understanding and, you know, you play around with it and then you begin to understand it. And then it's easy to forget. It, it, it could be intimidating. And so I think there's a lot of things that we need to figure out in crypto. You know, number one is like, key management and usability just to make it feel easy to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, but since we're so early, it's like default expert mode. Yeah. I was talking to one of my friends who works on the A16Z crypto team recently. And I was like, I think the whole crypto community needs a better CMO. Like there needs <laughs> yeah. to be someone who communicates these concepts in a way that a five-year-old could understand. Like even the term DAO, I feel yeah. like it, it needs a rebanding, like a refresh. So yeah, I'm happy to help you guys brainstorm what the new name could be. It is yeah. kind of amazing that NFT as a term like ended up working. I saw someone tweet, I can't remember who it was, but it was like, we need like a new term for NFT. And I was like, I don't know, it's too late. This was like right before <laughs> everything right. started happening like a month ago when it, when it started going like really crazy. But like, yeah. It's kind of wild that on like CNBC, like they're talking about mm -hmm. NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Like it's like the the driest, least inviting term I've ever I've ever heard.
Yeah. That's true, but I think it's notable that Top Shot does not use that term on the website. Mm -hmm. I think they use moments, mm -hmm. um, like own the best moments and start your collection. They don't use the term NFT. And I think that's because the audience that they're going after, like it's just a mainstream audience who doesn't really understand and doesn't really need to understand how the technology underneath it works. They just want to feel like they own this like moment from their favorite player. So I'm not sure if the term NFT really is all that mainstream. Yeah, and I think the term DAO is a bit sci-fi and it's kind of intimidating to, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I, you know, was thinking like from, from a gamer perspective, you're starting a guild and you have a guild mm -hmm. bank or a community bank yeah, um, kind of notions where it's like shared. And I think maybe a better term for a DAO would be like online co-op or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like that yeah. a lot. Well, I also want to get some more people up on stage because we don't want to, we don't have a monopoly on good ideas. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to invite some friends up to speak. Scott, Greg, Chris. Hey guys, what's on your mind? Hey, what's up? Um, okay, so I had this question for you, James. I talked to someone from a role like one of these companies that helps you do tokens or like they call it social money and one of the things that came up was we're talking about okay like my own token like would we call it chris token or would we call it teach or or even phd and i kind of want your perspective on that because what he was telling me was that they've kind of moved away from this thought of the coin being kind of attached to the person like alex was or like chris would be and instead, it makes more sense to call it like right or wisdom or guru or teach or something. I'm wondering if you could if you can maybe explain why that is. Yeah. So, you know, you have a blockchain and it's immutable, right? And some people think of it as a feature. But if you're a creator and you have your name tied to something that's immutable and would like live on for the foreseeable future, there's, I think, a psychological friction that I've seen to brand yourself on this thing that no one really knows about. We're just kind of like getting into. And so it's it's almost like, am I going to have to support what they, you know, colloquially call a shit coin for the rest of my life? Is this going <laughs> to follow me or haunt me? And so I think that like putting it out as an NFT where it's a work, yeah, it's by me, but it's not me i think from a psychological perspective is is less of a of a potential burden that'd be a great band name by the way haunted by shit coins i just think someone <laughs> else to start that band greg i'm really curious on your thoughts on tokenized communities especially you know we've talked a lot about communities in the past um curious if you have any thoughts on them and especially like what use cases um, are unlocked by making it a tokenized community versus just a regular community. So I've been thinking about this a lot and actually James and I were talking <laughs> like a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. um, hey James. Hey. Uh, one of the things we were talking about was sharding NFTs. So James, I think is really smart in the sense that he's like, I'm gonna go buy a story, AKA this NFT. I'm gonna go put it into a thousand pieces essentially. I'm going to create tokens out of it. I'm going to create a community out of that. And then I'm going to admit, like these tokens are basically admit one ticket to, to this community. And I think oftentimes like you do need that story to get people, because Nathan, your question was like, well, why do you really need the NFT? And I think people move with stories. And I think it's like, gonna be a huge part of of uh, tokenized communities going forward is the relationship between NFTs and communities. The way I think about it is uh, NFTs are going to be the modern day domain name, like .com for communities. So like the example I would use is like, if you see on Twitter, someone talking about how amazing invest.com is. And it's just like the best stock trading app. You have so much trust in it just by by virtue of the domain being invest.com. It's like, they must have spent a million dollars on it. It's invest.com, they must know what they're doing. And I think the same thing is true with, you know, a Legion NFT. 
I mean, he basically invented the, the term around it. So I think there's this actually arbitrage opportunity around NFTs and its relationship with tokenized communities. I'm extremely, extremely bullish on, on it. And we're working on a few at late checkout. Just to add to that, I think there's, yeah, like a really interesting, and I think someone like Balaji was talking about this too, like a distinction between institutions and like individuals that like hasn't really existed before. Lee, you just put up this blog post and basically create this kind of industry and then like create this whole line of thinking that led to this moment where you have this NFT in the first place that's sold in this way and able to sort of like be part of that brand. I think that's just something that's unprecedented. And, you know, I I couldn't, I couldn't have imagined that world in 2012, 2013. And I think that increasing capacity to build these sort of individual brands. I'm super excited about the experiments around that. I think we're very early, but they allow you to basically create that connection with the audience that, or community rather, I think that there's actually a very like important distinction between those two that like wouldn't have existed pre-crypto. So really actually excited about that model that James proposed. Yeah, I, I think that when you look at like technology from a historical perspective, it's technology that like changes society, right? With the modern city because of factories and you can be argued the schooling system was not to have people learn, but to be trained, mm-hmm. right? And then you have like, when you look at technology history the first cameras were just pointed at like a vaudeville stage and they thought okay we're done but then you know you had multi-camera then you had post editing and you're able to like have your own film language travel in time with this story and so there's this inherent things that we now culturally accept that were unlocked because of the technology, you know, if I were to, you know, take my phone and time travel 15 years ago and and show you my iPhone, you'd say, oh yeah, I kind of get it. It's like, you know, it's like the internet, but it's faster. And oh yeah, I get this like touch interface. Okay, this is really cool. This is really exciting. But, you know, I would say to you, no, this is gonna legitimize hitchhiking. And these second order effects that the technology enables we have no concept of and this crypto is on the internet it's going to be inherently remixed right we're remixing nfts now into social tokens into a governance platform that could potentially help creators and so i think this is just the beginning of like these experiments that probably couldn't happen if not for crypto or for technology to unlock i I do want to add one more point which is just like almost like going back to the point about being too early, like one of those cautionary points. And it is one of those things that's like very useful to note in a bull market. Crypto has these cycles. I don't know if for people who aren't familiar with crypto, there's like been kind of like four cycles since Bitcoin began and, you know, things slow down for a bit and then like new trends emerge and those become like really hot and people kind of like really latch onto those and then things sort of like calm down a bit. And then those trends kind of get remixed in ways that are just like, increasingly value add for people. So there actually was sort of an NFT trend where people were just like creating, for example, like CryptoKitties, which is how the NBA NBA Top Shot folks got their start. And they sort of learned from that and they iterated on that with a sort of different platform. And I think that was like really informative to them. But one of the things that like, I think we're learning in this market and you're, you're seeing a distinction between different types of creators that like approach it one way or the other, like, There's creators that kind of like, whether intentionally or not, create their own stock market. And there's creators that like reward and include their fans. And I think that like, there's not always necessarily a distinction between those two, but like the one thing to be really like careful about is just like find creators and artists who really want to curate a community and really want to like find those hundred true fans. So I think that like this is a really interesting experiment in that vein, but that's my uh, you know, necessary bull market cautionary statement. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. You know, I, I think what we're doing here is we're getting exposure in this bull, but we're positioning ourselves for the next bull market, right? I, I experienced this when going from like web 1.0 to 2.0, where web 1.0 is like, you know, the IPO market and, you know, it's gone, went crazy. And then like, 
you know, the dot-com bubble burst, there was this crash. And, you know, it's during that time when people really started to build. That's th that where it's like, okay, what are we going to do now? And that kind of led to this emergence of like social media. And I think that bring it back to like this last cycle, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have been through this last bear market because the signal to noise ratio was really great. And now during this bull market, you know, there is this like having a filter from the previous bear. And so we'll go through this bull, everyone's gonna get super excited. And, you know, there's gonna be a correction inevitably because there always is, it's, it's cyclical. And then it's those that come through this next bear cycle into the next bull that will be well positioned, I think. And so that's kind of another reason why we wanna start now. And like with, with CryptoKitties uh, and Dapper Labs, which was kind of this bull market for NFTs in like, I think at end of 2017, they took those lessons and built during the bear to now emerge with flow and like NBA top shots. So it's like, we're positioning ourselves now, there'll be a correction. We'll see who's really in it for the right reasons. And that's the great thing about a correction. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I want to toss out a question into the universe here and get your thoughts on when we get to that next cycle, what does the world look like? And especially this is a question that is very near to my future. Like what does venture capital look like given that the trend and what crypto enables is access for everyone and user owned platforms. So I'm curious on your guys' thoughts here, especially since venture capital historically has been predicated on the idea of access not being democratized to everyone and capital living in a set of folks who didn't have access and the people who have access don't necessarily have capital. And now we're, we seem to be moving towards a world in which everyone has access. Uh, I'll let I James can... talk, or yeah, James has like the most context on this. But the one thing I want to say is like, for me, that this has been like a crusade that I've been on for like almost my whole life. And, and we talked about this a bit earlier. Like I have wanted to invest in like, private companies for the longest time since I was like relatively young and you would go mm -hmm. in and look at things that were in the regular stock market and you'd be like okay this is fine this is like a, like much worse stock like right. and then like oh this like private company is much better but like I'm only able to purchase this particular like set of things and like that whole restriction from like accredited investor regulations was like one of the banes of my existence so I just think it's like the the models we have in place in the like traditional financial system, I think are very antiquated precisely for that reason. Like anything that you find in the public market is just as likely to be good or just as likely to be bad as something you find in the private market. And so I think that like what crypto has realized is there's a lot of demand for people to really be at like the ground level of projects of like people they care about or people they, you know, really mm -hmm. followed for a long time. And I think that like that opportunity is really something that's never existed, at least in like, like North American markets. And I think that's like the, for me, like one of the most beautiful parts of the space. So DAOs, I think, although the branding needs a lot of work, will be a really big part of that. So yeah, James is one of the people who's done so much development work on DAOs. So James, sorry for the, the rant there, but I'll give it to you. No, that was great. No, that was great. I, and, and I think it is going to de democratize investing and what do VCs have? They have this professional skill of diamond hands that I think pattern matching across different community tokens is what you need. You know, it's people that will hold and hold for a long time and have the discipline. And it's not about day trading. It's not about retail. It's about like people coming in. And I think that there's this window right now of VCs that get it and those that don't. And you, it's a contact sport. Like you can't just passively invest in crypto. You have to like be understanding it. You have to be an operator. Richard Kim talks about this. Uh, he's with Galaxy Interactive of like, he started uh, RNG, which is a token uh, and gates access. And he's bringing in people from uh, the game development ecosystem and crypto. So he has a nice blend of both. And we, you know, we're going to figure this out and the asymmetric information advantage because of the discipline that's been acquired professionally from VCs is this kind of window that will separate those that, you know, do and those that don't, I think. And so again, part of the reason, like in terms of purchasing this NFT, 
was, you know, you got to get this token into the right hands first. And when it comes to community tokens, starting that foundation, starting that community, you know, a DAO is a community of people. You, you need to have that, those diamond hands that are going to set the floor so that the bottom doesn't just kind of fall out from under you. And I think investors have that, just having exposure to startups where they can see the up and downs and they have a, a broader like time horizon for things, as opposed to those that are just aping into crypto now, looking for some short-term gains, they have the paper hands or they're just pure speculators and they're, and they're leaving, right? The community needs to weather the storm of that type of influence and you need that foundation. And I think VCs are very much primed right now at this moment in time to like, to, to be able to interact with a community. And that's where it's going to go, where, you know, crypto is going to get democratized. And I think VCs need to be part, active part of that conversation. And I, I, I think you see some of that too, in terms of those that kind of get it, you know, here on Clubhouse, you know, with Mark and Dreesen and uh, Horowitz, they're, they're like actively mm -hmm. participating. And with A16Z too, it's, you know, they say it's a, it's a VC firm that's kind of disguised as a media company or the other way around, you know, like right. it, it, it's going to be this like next level interaction where web two, you had the consumer turn into a producer, right? 20 years ago, who's people are going to like say, said, who's ever going to blog? Who's ever going to micro blog? And then you have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatnot. I think web three turns the investor into an employee, into a customer, and it kind of blends all of that together. And we're gonna figure out kind of how or where that lands. But yeah, I think you have to participate. And you know, for VCs that that, you know, this is kind of this window of opportunity or or, or time to to participate in that. Uh, and I think that's what you know you're doing. And I think you're doing a great job at that. Oh, thank you. So many interesting threads to pull on. I feel like my my mind is spinning. I, I need to take time tonight to like think through all of the implications of everything. But I also invited Okiki up to the stage. Hi. Hey, uh, great talk. Yeah, so a question, I guess, kind of like to the broader or a group, but I, I guess also specifically like James and Scott, because I feel like they know a lot about like DAOs and have been thinking about community. I'm um, actively engaged in it. When you look at like what happened recently with role and kind of like these things where you're like, wow, okay, people are wondering what was a centralized risk? The, and, you know, there it is to an extent. Do you think that there might be an opportunity for these different community tokens? Kind of going back to what was said earlier about why a lot of these uh, community tokens, they don't go by their specific names, but they go by like a concept. So that way, you know, it's, actually, it's able to outlive them. That some of these community tokens basically create a sort of DAO of DAOs. And then through that kind of like, if somebody wants to, you know, gain access to this sort of like, we can even call it like a, I guess, kind of like a, a commons between all, all of these different communities, then they kind of have to be voted in. Do you think that there's kind of like interest or appetite or potentially room for that? And if not, what, what sort of pattern do you think would kind of like supersede that once, you know, more and once more creators start to actually create communities, maybe moving past Patreon and actually being able to basically kind of bridge the gaps between creator communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can answer that real quick and to provide some quick context. I think it was yesterday uh, or the day before there was uh, a token issuer that was hacked. And what that meant was their hot wallet was compromised. And that hot wallet held a lot of different social tokens. And when that was compromised, the attacker went onto Uniswap and drained the pool and just used, so uh, without getting into it, there's, a, there, there's this thing called Tornado Cash where you can, it's called, a, it's a mixer that kind of shields transactions. So you can't follow, or it's very difficult to follow kind of the origins or, or the transaction history. And so they washed those tokens and effectively what it did was it put a lot of tokens basically to zero. And, you know, there is this distinction. It's hard to communicate. You know, if you think about like data privacy is something that's just getting into kind of the zeitgeist and, and mainstream, 
And when you talk about trust assumptions, that's kind of like a whole nother level. And that's another reason why, you know, I'm, I kind of feel almost obligated and another kind of confounding factor that said, you know, I got to buy this piece. I have to be part of this dialogue. I have to be part of this conversation because, you know, you can have this progressive decentralization. There's a path to it so that you can get mainstream adoption, but mitigate the centralized risk. But what that requires is a lot of plumbing to be done so that there is an exit. And so it's a very fine point. It's very technical, but I think, you know, that is why I also kind of want to get ahead of this and, and kind of do this kind of outrageous act because, you know, we don't want something like a role to happen again. And then when it comes to DAOs, there is this like, so there's Molog V1. Molog V1 was a grant giving DAO, no token. It was a reaction to the whole ICO kind of thing. And so there was no token. You can only put skin in the game. Molog V2, you have the Lao and Meta Cartel Ventures using it as like a crypto base venture vehicle. Now you have Moloch V3, it just came out of audit where it's DAOs all the way down. So it's like a network of DAOs. So you can imagine, like you're saying, a DAO or community actually participating with another DAO or another community. And you saw that in terms of this role incident that happened, you see the whale community coming in and helping the FWB community. And this is where it's not protocol based, it's community based. And you're seeing these community tokens like banding together and helping each other. And I think what you'll see in the future is, you know, potentially like a wallet interface. And I'm going to like be able to see your profile or something. And I'll see all the tokens that you hold. And that's not going to be your identity per se, but it's what you're paying attention to. It's, it's what you have skin in the game with. And I'm like, oh, okay. I can get an understanding of who you are, not based off who you follow, which doesn't have really any costs associated with it. I don't want to go down the identity rabbit hole, but you can say, okay, imagine, you know, being able to monitor the chain and see people that have a threshold of like, I don't know, 80, 90% of the same token holdings that you have. You're like, okay, you know, that person is I'm going to kind of know what that person is about. And conversely, like, you know, if there's someone that is in your tokenized community, but you're like, whoa, I have never heard of any of these other communities or any of these tokens, you know, that can also be a signal. And so when it comes to crypto and tokens and DAOs, it's not a, only a way of like capital formation or organizing people. It's also this signal. And I think because it has value attached to it, it could be a more meaningful signal than a like. And so you can, in the future, maybe be able to strike up a conversation or you know, understand what that person is about by the, the tokens they hold. And you'll see organizationally different DAOs potentially interacting with each other or holding each other's tokens. Like in this case that we're trying to do with like these influencers that, you know, saying and signaling to them, you know, here's some funds to help you just be creative and we believe in you. And so, you know what, we'll take some of your, your social tokens uh, as well. And, you know, there's this like virtuous loop there, I think. And this is kind of what we're, you know, experimenting with and, and seeing, you know, you know, right now there's this zero sum game happening, but with social token, can we strive for a positive sum world? Yeah. I just want to like, take a, a quick like step back on that. Like, I think that's a really good like set of points. And just one thing that came up earlier in the conversation was like the idea of like crypto as a city. And I think it might like help describe like some of what we're talking about for those that are like newer to the ecosystem. And so the, the idea basically of any of these currencies, like any, any of these DAOs or like community groups is that you kind of have this shared base of this metaverse that you're working within. So you you all have like a creator that you follow, you have a certain project that you really, you know, all believe deeply in. And what you do is you create the token kind of around that that idea in order to almost create a community currency that aligns incentives. And what Ethereum managed to do with this was get a lot of people really early on very incentivized to help grow the ecosystem. And those people eventually ended up making some of the like best, like largest applications that are on the platform today. 
And all those people do a few things. So they, one, they like go back and they fund the public infrastructure, which is actually just a really cool corollary of all this. Like in web two, the idea that you would fund like an open source library was very weird. Like no one understood why, you know, it would be funded and often it wasn't funded. Natty Eggball has written a lot of really good work about that. But then like when these communities started to form, they formed their own tokens and those tokens basically created, you know, the, their own alignment between the creator and the people who were in those groups. And then those kind of evolved into being, you know, not just about like creators that were in Web3, but now with NFTs and this sort of movement um, about creators that are in Web2 and creators that are just in your daily lives, but still for you exist in the metaverse, exist digitally in a lot of ways, especially this, this past year. So all of these different communities are people coming together towards a common goal, like with aligned incentives and with like voting powers to make decisions for that community. And what's really interesting about what you're saying, James, is that like before when you were like creating a company, another form of like creating sort of an enterprise for, you know, a, a shared goal with a bunch of people, you were really incentivized to just like only build your company and only make your company successful. But because of this shared underlying infrastructure and because of this shared underlying kind of connection, the different creators who have made these tokens in the case of tokens on roll or tokens on other platforms because of that shared connection they have they've managed to really generate like almost a bond that results in them kind of collaborating more actively than they might in sort of the, the traditional corporate or even like artistic world like you never see record labels really collaborating in, in web 2 like it's not not like really a common occurrence that you you often think about but for example three lao and rac are like constantly collaborating and like they're constantly collaborating, not just independently, but through their communities. And those sorts of token swaps and those sorts of skin in the game mechanisms between communities are like really important. So I just want to like kind of like simplify that language just in case anyone sort of missed that. I think it's a really important point that like James brought up. There's one other slightly separate point, which is just like something like role is bad for crypto in some ways because it's not to James's point decentralized. So you don't want something that like you don't control the keys of because the keys are your access to all your funds. So if someone else has your keys, they basically have all your coins. And so ultimately what Roll did was they just had a hot wallet. They had a percentage of creators funds for their tokens when they were issued. And then that, you know, just disappeared when Roll was hacked because it was centralized. So I think this idea of DAOs that we're moving towards is one that's much closer to the Moloch model where things are just like by default, like fully decentralized. The only people that have coins are people who are part of the community, who are actively engaged, who have either earned them by being part of the community or by like starting off the community themselves. And so that's just like a bit of rant, but hopefully that helps clarify a few of the moving parts in the space. It's a very complicated space. Yeah, yeah. That, that's really interesting. Another topic that I want to hear your guys' thoughts on is I feel like social tokens and tokenized communities, it's often um, held up as this way to align incentives and to have, you know, have skin in the game with your favorite creator, your favorite community or whatever. I want to talk a little bit about the risks associated with them, or maybe not even risks, but like what are the things that we need to be aware of in terms of like the second order effects of what we should keep in mind if a creator or whoever else decides to create a social token? Yeah, this is, we need to be really, really careful. I think that if, if a creator is creating a token, you know, you have the just creator stress and the mental health issues that go around just like, because you can't skip the platforms right now. Mm -hmm. And so we gotta, you, you're going to have to you know, do all the things that a creator does. And now you have this token and you may not have people that believe in the creator by the token. And if they have governance rights, they're going to say, hey, creator, like do this thing that's going to make the coin pump, which yeah. may be, you know, antithetical to what you stand for or may, you know, not be in alignment long-term. So you have this like, you know, kind of tension between like short-term versus long-term incentives. And so we got to be really careful. And I know some of these community organizers can be stressed because, you know, these aren't professional investors. 
and they, they don't really have the training, the discipline, the fortitude, you know, the whatever it is to like understand. So I think like there's that extra stress or component that we got to really be careful about. That's why, you know, it's, it's better to have this as a form of play. You know, it's, it's kind of a toy. And then, you know, you have this disclaimer, just expect to lose it all and all that stuff so that, you know, you don't have these like unanticipated expectations that cause a stress that can cause misalignment. And, you know, you just want to m- communicate and make expectations very clear. And I think that if you just had a community token, this goes back to like, why NFT first? It's like, that's the, the rallying cry here, this NFT, and people can get focused on that. And then from there, have that conversation. And I think there's going to need to be, you know, just like in traditional kind of organizations where you may have lockup or vesting periods, right? They're there for a reason and they've worked. Just because it's crypto doesn't mean that like those type of mechanism designs or those type of processes uh, are also outdated. They, they may also work with like social tokens to alleviate pressure. So you know that those tokens are locked and you can't touch them or can't move them for a certain amount of time. So it, it's playing around and iterating and it's learning by doing, I think. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it, this is part of that whole kind of experiment, but we, we do have to be very careful. Jesse Walden has a great sort of piece about the connection between patronage and profit. And one mm-hmm. of the sort of ideas here is that when you're creating tokens, you're aligning those incentives and someone who's a really early fan has the potential to really benefit from your growth as an artist. And that comes with a like responsibility that like artists may not be prepared for. It kind of echoes what you were saying, James, but like, I think artists who are very early on in their careers have a tremendous opportunity through this because they can align those incentives early. They can find their true fans early, but if they're doing that before they're ready, they might end up in a scenario where, you know, they feel responsible to people in a way that like, is much stronger than the responsibility that you have when you produce an album or when you put out a piece of writing. And I think that that can be, you know, for newer artists, like very scary. So just being cognizant of that and like trying to guide artists through that process is is really important. Yeah, it's reminiscent of the dynamic that gets introduced when a company, when a startup gets external funding from investors versus remaining independent and bootstrapped. It does add this sense of responsibility. And in some ways it makes the company beholden to other people beyond just the founders and the employees. And all of a sudden there's, you know, the expectation that there's going to be a return. And I can see how that would also create stresses for individual creators. And just like how indie hackers has sort of emerged as the foil and the community for companies that have decided to stay independent and not raise external funding. And they have this, like they use this language of people who want to be independent and in control of their own destiny and just run profitable lifestyle businesses. I wonder if the same will kind of emerge for creators who decide to stay independent. I definitely think so. I think at some point there'll be a choice that creators make. And like, again, yeah, not every path is for everyone. Not every company yeah, I should raise capital and not every creator needs to have a coin. I think that's like one of the really important pieces here as we get into like the bull market. Like there's lots of cases where it's really interesting to experiment, but like doing it at a small scale, doing it with, you know, a group of fans or loyal like community followers that you trust that understand the dynamics, I think is like really key. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Travis, Hey. what's on your mind? Hey. Yeah. So thanks for having me up here. I think I just wanted to, to ask for both from for like creators, as well as for folks who are building for creators, it seems like you're either building or like have have crypto platforms, or or, or non crypto platforms, and there, there's like a pretty big divide between them. Is there a way to, to like, build for, for both or some middle ground, as opposed to just either you're a crypto play or you're not not a crypto play? But I definitely think there's like, a mixture, just like a creator can have many different streams of income in web two, a creator can have many different streams of web three income and and those can mix as well. Like the idea that, you know, everything needs to be tokenized is um, probably not true, but the idea that like, you know, there's no uses for tokens is also equally untrue. And so I think the, the ideal world would be one in which, and you are seeing some platforms explore this, like 
where creators can sort of earn crypto and like distribute crypto, but like very easily transfer that back to some kind of like dollar equivalent and like interchange those those elements. In the nonprofit space, this actually already occurs on like platforms like the Giving Block, where they can just basically give money to if you're a crypto like sort of like creator and you've you've made some amount of money, you can basically give money back to charities of your choice. And like it's a very easy process to kind of like on and off board through that that ramp that they have. So I think that's probably how it'll play out. Like creators will, for example, maybe have like a tokenized Discord community, but then for example, create most of their art just like in a traditional setting, especially if, for example, they're not planning to make like digital art, they're planning to make like maybe a, a large like sculpture or a piece of architecture, or, like things that are uh, possibly tokenizable, but like might be better uh, viewed like in person. And, you know, by contrast, someone could create an NFT, create digital art, um, but create a completely open community channel, which monetizes other parts of their work without really needing to actually take that next step. So it'll really depend on the artist, but there's definitely a mixture. So just, just a follow-up question. Like, I, I feel like for, for folks who are comfortable with NFTs and crypto, like that's a very reasonable path, but in, in, in my kind of, at least like my perspective on things, a lot of people are still very, very shy and, and like just not always, you know, it's like if they see crypto, it's just a, a different level of, of risk. And I, I guess like definitely having multiple streams, being able to experiment with, you know, NFTs or, or, or crypto to, to what extent, if you were, if you were building a, a platform and like, it didn't absolutely rely on, on something that, that had to be crypto, but it could just as easily use like Stripe, you know, what's, what's the middle ground there? Is it, is it, you either use Stripe or you, you, you go full crypto? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually have a really good example of like Stir has some really good experiments around this. Stir, for those who don't know, is kind of a platform for creators to like earn streams of income and manage their income. And they've done all these drops with various types of basically structured platforms or like um, like tools for creators to use. And one of them was called uh, Pre-Subscribe, which was made by this um, guy in who also works actually funny enough in crypto. And the idea behind that was basically that someone could take their Twitter following and they could wait for enough subscribers to get to a threshold for them to publish a piece. And they, they could basically say, hey, you know, you're my followers. I want you to like contribute together, you know, thousands and dollars to view my, my, my content. And if they were to hit that threshold, then they, it was kind of like an insurance contract where you would get them to write the work. And funny enough, there's a platform in crypto called Mirror, which does something kind of similar. And it uses tokens to basically align those incentives. But the model underlying both of those is very similar. And so, yeah, it's very possible to replicate some of these models in Web2 still. You lose some of the trade, the trade-off is you lose some of the like kind of connection with fans and that patronage plus profit sort of connection. Yeah, so I, I, I absolutely love Stir and, and, and Mir. I feel, feel like they're a little bit different sides of the of the, of the world where, where one's kind of more traditional and they have this startup studio like drop model and, and it's almost like like the the pre-subscribe is independent so they're able to to like dip their toes into the the, the crypto world but like their main platform is still traditional yeah i think yeah. there's there's quite a number of like web 2 platforms that kind of start to have this web 3 ethos of ownership and some examples that i can point to of this are in my portfolio so stir mirror well mirror is a crypto platform but dumpling also is a platform that enables like grocery shoppers to start their own small businesses so they get to keep more of their earnings rather than the platform just farming out specific tasks to certain shoppers and routing all of that and intermediating the customer relationship. And I think of that as kind of like an intermediate model that has a lot of the spiritual elements of Web3, but is not technically a crypto platform. Yeah, there's, there's also unlock protocol. So you can use a credit card and what you're doing is actually buying an NFT. That NFT is like a, a subscription, but you don't have to worry about that NFT at all if you don't want to, unless you want to resell your subscription. So there's this like idea of just paying with a credit card, being able to like just you know unlock content, basically like subscription, it could be reoccurring and whatnot. And then kind of advanced mode is, okay, really there's an NFT behind this, 
And if I wanted to download MetaMask or a wallet, then I can and associate it with this NFT. I don't have to though. And then I can like sell or resell my, my subscription if I wanted to. But yeah, other than that, I, 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 I think it's a really interesting point. And we need to kind of make those lines a little more blurry and get getting that like friction down a bit. Is this kind of what you're doing with Abridged? Yeah. I mean, in the name, it's like kind of shortcutting crypto for quote unquote normies. And, you know, what we're doing with Collabland is instead of, you know, trying to do all things crypto, we're, it's just a bot in, in Telegram and in Discord. And, you know, if the, if the admin, you know, allows the bot in, then, you know, for us, our customer base is not just that admin, but all the people in the Discord server. And so strategically, you know, we're, we're trying to leverage that. We think that, you know, crypto is here to stay. It'll be like, if you can imagine an underlying substrate, these platforms will come and go today. It's Discord, Telegram, tomorrow, as soon as Clubhouse has an API, will be Clubhouse five, seven years from now, it'll be whatever AR, VR, whatever takes off. But the communities can actually be consistent. And hopefully this rebalances platform power or incentives. And hopefully if there's enough of these tokenized communities, there'll be platforms that start, there might be a, an inflection point where you know they have to start kind of understanding that these communities can just move in droves because they're incentivized to, and who knows, maybe that will, will change platform policy, or at least have an acknowledgement that, you know, these communities can, can mobilize because again, the, the core kind of thesis or hypothesis when it comes to crypto is reducing coordination costs. And so through incentive and incentive alignment, maybe, you know, you, you award people in crypto or points to get off of one platform and onto another. And the community is empowered. There's this community sovereignty there that can be upheld. And, you know, we see that where some people are on Telegram and some people are on Discord. They're on different platforms, but they can actually make governance decisions together, but on separate platforms. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how that manifests and, and how platforms, you know, next-gen platforms react to that. Awesome. So I want to start winding down this conversation, I wanted to end on a question for each of you guys. I just want to hear which idea are you most excited about? Like, what are you looking forward to coming into fruition in the future? Or what is like a possibility that either we've highlighted in this conversation or not that you are most excited about? And we'll start with James. Yeah, I think what I'm most excited about is unleashing crypto for everyone to, you know, do what what they believe in, in terms of impact investing. And, you know, with tokens, you don't have to just buy your way into a group, you know, with some communities, you can earn your way through sweat equity. And I think that, you know, we're just kind of at the very early stages of this, but with Ethereum, it's permissionless. Anyone can do anything. It's naive to think that it's all going to be good. And we're going to reach this nirvana or this like utopia. I think, you know, we've seen that with like web 2.0, Google's slogan used to be, don't be evil. They, you know, had to get rid of that. And you, you see this kind of centralization of, of influence and power in, in these platforms. And my hope for crypto is being able to, you know, help with those that are uh, underserved and that, you know, the creator middle class really is what has spoken to me in kind of this first step toward this longer vision of helping those that, you know, are underserved, be able to kind of pick themselves up from their own bootstraps. And, you know, we want to make sure that we create the systems, at least in Collabland, the tools that tend toward that and help that. Love that. Scott, how about yourself? Yeah, I was, I was actually going to go on a whole thing about like the like public infrastructure we all use and like open source and like how that can be funded better. And like, that's my whole jam. But like, I saw actually Shlomes joined who has like a whole history in the NFT space. I don't know, for those who haven't followed his work, it's kind of an avant-garde, like almost absurdist take on like the entire notion of what art is within the context of NFTs, within the context of digital art. And for me, like, I think maybe the better answer, which is a bit more general than, you know, my, my ambitions around like trying to 
help you know developers as creators in the open source space. It's funny, like people don't think about developers as like underserved creators or artists, but open source developers are like not paid really at all, and they they kind of make all the stuff possible that we're using even right now. But my answer would be make the internet kind of weird again. If you look back to like Web One, everyone just had their own random blog. They just like put that mm -hmm. up there. They just hope for the best. They had a kind of audience that accrued around them. There was no real like discovery. It was just kind of people posting very like authentic art that was like really interesting to them. And I think that Web3 has sort of enabled, especially in the sort of early generations of these cycles, really novel forms of creation that are like completely unprompted by anything else sort of happening in the world. And so I'm glad that he joined the stage because that's, I think he's a really great example of that. So let's try to like, you know, experiment, be bold and make the internet weird again, hopefully. Love that. Hey, Greg. Um, what I'm interested in is sustainable communities. For too long, people have been making communities that have been unsustainable, where you have community managers or creators who are creating communities out of their sheer goodwill. And I love that mm -hmm. about them. And I've interviewed hundreds or thousands of them, and it's inspiring. But I think it doesn't need to be that case anymore. And I think that some of these financial incentives and just incentives in general are going to create a whole next batch of really, really interesting community social experiments. And sign me up. Love it. I very much look forward to that future as well of sustainable communities. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, you guys have already all said it better than... I could and in, in your writing as well, Lee, like just the way that crypto seems like it's going to be able to let more people be, you know, their true selves, be as creative as they want to be and escape their nine to fives. And through this aligning of incentives, that's that's the best. I'm excited for that. Awesome. OK, Key, any thoughts? Greg, you stole my answer. <laughs> I was going to I was going to go on a little bit of like a, a tangent about like. Like I ran basically like my school's confessions page during undergrad and it was chill because like it was a break for me. Like I was like doing sports and all this stuff, but I, I remember reading a number of like articles where people are running way more involved Facebook groups and how they burn out and how, you know, these groups will, you know, just blow up and then weird things happen. So like when I look at groups like, you know, friends with benefits, and I, I look at like all the good work that, that James is doing through Abridged and Collab, I'm thinking like, wow, okay, like this is like a solution. And it seems to be like, based on what I'm seeing, like this seems to be working well. So I think like the one big thing that I've been really interested in within crypto is just seeing how it'll change once there are more stakeholders, like kind of like seeing some of the crypto art discourse where a ton of people are saying, you know, I'm actively gonna use proof of stake networks. And hey, maybe it's not like a lot today, but maybe as more and more people say, you know what, I actually do want to mint crypto art, I'm going to mint it on Tezos or some other chain. Th those people, like assuming, you know, their art sells and yada, 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 they will probably become stakeholders, like literally and figuratively for those chains. So then the, the this, this sort of like discourse ends up being, I guess, kind of like an onboarding for different communities. So really interested in seeing how that plays out over time. If these sorts of kind of like producers that aren't necessarily technical and, you know, participating in governance and things like that and shifting the way that a lot of these chains end up becoming developed, because I think that that'll kind of like make things a lot more interesting, more competitive. And instead of it being this thing where everyone's like, oh, they, these are just a bunch of, you know, solutions looking for problems. You can actually say, well, no, here's like 500 people saying they needed this feature or even like 10,000 people or, you know, 500 people speaking on behalf of 10,000 people. So yeah, just super excited to see like how the, the space will change as more people um, get onboarded. Awesome. Travis, what do you think? Yeah, I feel like I'm most excited about kind of a future where folks are, are, able to work more, more independently, more on, on what they love. And, you know, I definitely see NFTs and, and DeFi and crypto as 
a a path there, you know, and, and kind of timing and and everything is is related to that. I think another another aspect that often gets overlooked when when people are talking about this is like crypto is is just one and, and blockchains are just one format for decentralization in general. And you know there are other data structures and you know like really interesting things like IPFS and like some some actual like consumer grade products that are coming to like like for instance there's this company Fleek it's kind of a competitor to, to Vercel just like actually real products that are starting to to get to market <laughs> that are not necessarily crypto but they're they're based on the same like decentralized properties and and I think I'm I'm really excited to see where that world goes you know like crypto is sexy right I mean it has to do with money and, and everything but beyond that like there's just so much more opportunity in terms of the architecture and what we can build with like a decentralized AWS or or you know different things in the future awesome Shlomo and Brian I think the one interesting thing playing out in crypto right now is this concept of crater DAOs, which James has sort of mentioned before. Sort of the end goal of, of crater DAOs in this case is sort of friends pulling their money together and selling NFTs and digital art together. But even on a later stage in that is sort of investment clubs becomes the new group chat and every, all the friends are basically going to be co-investing together into a culture that they love. And even to the point where everyone's investing in different pieces of culture with their friends. And that's that's going to be a really weird future. I don't know if I'm exactly excited about it, but it's one <laughs> that's definitely coming pretty soon. So we'll, we'll see how that ex- exactly plays out and how it intersects with the rest of the media landscape. Interesting. I can definitely say that like we, myself and my analyst, Lila, we did this recent survey of little kids, like Gen Alpha, I think they're called, and what they do for fun like what their hobbies are and their pastimes. And one of them is literally stock trading. This is what the younger generation is growing up doing today. So I definitely think that this vision of investment clubs being the new group chat, it's not far-fetched at all. I can definitely see that coming into fruition, especially as there's more asset classes for them to invest in that feel more related to their everyday lives. Totally. Yeah, um, personally, what I'm most excited about is a future where I'm valued for the creative part of my brain. I think most of the career paths available to me out of out of college mostly involved numbers or, you know, technical things that I wasn't super excited about, but was, you know, good enough at to get by. But there was always like this chaotic, crazy part of my brain that I sort of let loose on Reddit and on Twitter, but didn't really get rewarded for it much in terms of, you know, socially or monetarily. And then within the past couple of months, it's completely changed. So, you know, if the NFT market crashes tomorrow, it'll still have been life-changing because I know that people value, you know, that side of me. It's pretty meaningful, actually. So I don't have any yeah. uh, very smart takes for you, but that's my uh, I love that. experience. I love that. By the way, I really like your Twitter feed. It's very, it's Thank very you. Sexy. Yeah. <laughs> I also and really I totally like your, agree. your oh, like, Twitter whatever is going on on your twitter yeah, like hard to, uh, yeah. hard to put in on it hard to put words yes. to it it's very cool go check it cool. check it out on twitter everyone yeah i totally resonate with what you just said i i feel like that creative part of our brains that's finally being appreciated and valued i feel like so validated for the first time ever in my life and honestly after the nft auction this weekend I cried because I had never sold anything for this amount of money before. And I know, James, it was like the highest that you've paid. So maybe it's an aberration. But like, I just felt like finally what I do and what I've done throughout my life had value and someone saw it and recognized it and appreciated it and didn't just appreciate it passively, but actually actively affirmed it through investing. And that was just such a powerful moment for me. And yeah, people have asked me, like, are you going to do more, more NFTs? And my answer is yes. I feel like I was made for this moment in time, this moment in history. And I think it's very special. So I love that. That's awesome. That's amazing. I'm just happy and grateful to be part of this and being part of this conversation. Uh, and it's all been sparked by your thoughts. And oh so my gosh, thank you. I would say keep up the great work. It's amazing. <laughs> 
Well, thanks. Well, now that you have invested in my first ever NFT, I definitely feel more pressure to have this <laughs> illustrious career because I know <laughs> someone's money is on the line. So hopefully I'll make it a worthwhile investment for you. <laughs> we believe in you. Thank you. This was such an awesome conversation. Really, probably my favorite. I'm not supposed to have favorites, but secretly, this is my favorite conversation on means of creation so far. So thank you so much. And thank you, James, for the mm -hmm. immense support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. bye.